Hi, this is Corey Jensen. I am the National Register Coordinator at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I am doing a series of historic uh, Utah architecture. And um, last time, if you saw that one, I gave an introduction on the types, on how we study types and styles of architecture in Utah and how um, other areas influence the architecture here. I'm going to start with the first uh, type of architecture, if you could call it that. It's not really a building, but it kind of is. And this is the dugout. Technically, the dugout is probably not considered a type because of the geography and available materials uh, dictated the method of construction and the size and form of the structure. Uh, thereby generating diversity in design. And um, so it doesn't really appear as a building per se, but it was used to house human activity. And so we consider it a building. Um, because of their ephemeral, a big word meaning not long lasting nature, um, just how common dugouts were is not really known. And it probably varied uh, by the settlement area of the state. Uh, settlers were likely inclined to build dugouts if there was a lack of knowledge about the uh, climatic conditions of the area and the agri agricultural prospects um, or the long-term uh, stability of the area. If survival and viability was questionable, then dugouts might be constructed until a better um, understanding of the permanence of the settlement was established. Uh, probably the most common reason for uh, construction of dugouts, however, was the expediency of settling a new area. Um, when a few families were called to settle, uh, there was understandably a lack of manpower, and most families would have to suffice with available resources until more permanent dwellings could be constructed. Uh, this usually meant waiting until after the land was cleared for planning and materials gathered for construction of a house, which could take time if you were trying to uh, get your farm and crops established. Uh, in some cases, uh, if there was a lack of avail available hands for uh, providing the necessities of the family, uh, occupation of the dugout could be for several years, um, even though it was hoped that it wouldn't be that long. Uh, most think of dugouts only as uh, very early housing in Utah. But on the contrary, there are references to this dwelling type uh, being implemented well into the 20th century. Uh, this is, there is a record of a person in Orangeville in Emory County living in a dugout during the Great Depression. And this probably was not the only occurrence. Uh, there's also recorded instances of dugouts being used for uh, sto uh, stores and post offices um, throughout the state, but mostly uh, in the middle uh, counties of Utah. Uh, counts are written also of dugout communities. In fact, um, during the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, Many of the Chinese workers lived in dugouts along the railroad corridor where they were building. And they were found throughout the United States, especially in the Midwest and the West. Uh, so what makes a dugout a dugout? As the name implies, the dwelling is partially subterranean. It is dug into the either flat ground uh, up to six feet deep or preferably into a south facing hillside. Uh, this would provide uh, summer um, shade as well as winter sun when the sun headed south for the winter, thereby warming up the, the dugout for those living inside. Um, the, the room size is varied. The typical size was about 12 feet by 12 feet, although they could be as large as uh, 18 by 18 and so forth from examples that have been found. The walls were constructed of a variety of items, either log, uh, earth, or stone. Uh, these were partially above ground around the perimeter, high enough to provide adequate headroom so they didn't have to dig as deep into the hillside. The roof could either be flat and sloped or have a shallow pitched gable. The roofs were constructed of heavy wood poles spaced evenly. The roofs were then um, covered, these poles were covered with willow or other type of uh, saplings or tree branches. And then these are covered with uh, straw or bundles of other weeds and rush. And over this, finally, was placed a thick layer of dirt. Uh, needless to say, the roof was little good in heavy rain. And there are a lot of accounts of uh, heavy rainstorms, um, water dripping through and 
uh, piling mud inside the, the dugout, and these would then have to be replaced once the rain passed. Uh, but they did do a pretty good job of insulation. Later examples, especially the ones I'm going to show you, had typically dimension lumber roofing. Uh, so they were they were flat boards that were then probably covered with uh, with dirt or mud uh, to provide insulation. The front wall of the dugout, the part that was mostly above ground, was made of whatever was available or was easy to gather. And these included vertical logs placed next to each other, um, vertical logs spaced apart with woven willow and mud infill, which we call daub and wattle, or sawn lumber. Uh, they could also be uh, constructed of stone, which uh, most of the examples I've seen are. Um, there would be a front door and typically no windows. The door could consist either of a, a wood door on hinges. On the early examples, it may consist just of a piece of canvas hung over the doorway, which did not provide much um, good in wind storms or, or winter weather. On the inside, the walls were usually bare earth. Uh, if there was time, they would be lined with stone and then whitewashed and sometimes even plastered um, to make a, a more finished interior. As uh, you can imagine, the interiors were pretty cramped and were set up to handle the variety of functions required for a home, including a bedroom, kitchen, and storage all in one single room. Uh, one account of a dugout in the Washington County area states that the beds were constructed of corner posts driven into the ground to which a woven wheel of support was attached. The posts of the bed were then um, used to support a large plank for an, improvis an improvised table. So spaces had to be shared and um, changeable uh, for the various uh, work for the day and then sleeping at night. There might even be a space for a bench or a couple of chairs, although this would have been cramped. A cupboard and maybe even a sheet metal stove or a small stone fireplace, but not much else. And as was typical of most homes, small homes at that time, uh, they were only used to shelter people at night because during the day they were usually out working. So um, conditions would be very cramped. Uh, one wonders how families survived in these dwellings, even for a short time, but they did until circumstances could improve so that they could build a better house, uh, a more permanent one. The permanent house often would incorporate the dugout into it, used either as a cellar or kept um, as a dugout on the property. I've seen both examples throughout the state. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to show you a couple of examples that we recorded here in Utah. So this example is uh, actually a pair of dugouts found on the hillside along Highway 89 in Sampy County. Um, they're pretty similar to each other. As you can see, they were both constructed of uh, random ashlar masonry, it meant that the stones are somewhat fashioned, but not completely squared off, and then laid in fairly even courses. The doorways on both of these, as you can see, are of um, sod logs, probably railroad ties left over from the rail line, the Rio Grande Railroad line that ran not too far from where these were. Um, the, so they had, as you can see, a little bit of a gabled roof on them, and this was covered in dimension lumber. We'll see that in a second when I show the interior. I'm certain that the dimension lumber was also covered with mud to provide insulation and protection from water seeping through the gaps on the, on the boards. If you look in the interior, you'll notice that the roofing is not as primitive as many dugouts. Um, in fact, along with the dimensioned lumber sheathing, you will see in the lower uh, right-hand slide that they use a corrugated uh, water pipe as rafters for, to hold up the dimensioned lumber on the one side. The upper photo shows the exact same interior, only you can see the other side of the roof is supported by uh, half-round logs that hold up the, um, the dimensioned lumber. And these are then supported by heavy log purlins. You can see at the rear of this, the, the back side of the dugout has washed in over the years, has not been occupied probably for several decades, if not a century. So over time, all the mud has kind of washed into the interior, but you still get a good idea of 
how um, these were constructed, especially the roofs. And then you can see it was supported on a flat layer of stones. And then the rest of the interior of this one was basically just mud. Uh, the living conditions in these, again, were not the best as all sorts of critters, mice, snakes, of course, spiders and bugs and other varmints would get in pretty easily. And so it was probably a common chore to keep the, the creepy crawlers out of these, these places. So whether this, uh, the roof on this with the metal pipe is original, I'm not sure. Uh, it could have been a later repair. This next example um, is again in central Utah in Emory County. And this one's a little uh, more architectural on the front. As you can see, the effort that was put in in the upper slide to build this, again, a random ashlar masonry front wall. These stones are layered more evenly and spread broadly across the front of this. This one actually has a single window, as you can see to the right of the doorway. The um, door uh, was fashioned with a, a wood door and a frame in it at one time. And the roof on this one is fairly flat. It does not have a, a gable or a real pitch to it other than maybe a pitch towards the back. And this one was also covered with dimension lumber, although the, it also had um, mud on top of it as well as brush to hold the mud in place. As you can see on the interior of this one, the walls are nicely laid uh, sandstone or limestone, which was one time whitewashed and possibly plastered. You can see the heavy beam running across, supported on a post. The, the roof on this one collapsed quite a while ago, probably uh, stepped on by some cows, as when I documented this, there was a dead cow right in the middle of the floor, which was not a pretty sight. So this was used on a ranch probably for ranch hands, as there are several uh, people's initials and um, ranch um, bars, whatever you call that, uh, their cattle brands um, inscribed on the door casings and other wood areas inside of this. Here's an example that um, is from Southwest Utah. Uh, pretty far west of Cedar City in a mining district. Uh, this one dates approximately from around the 1890s or possibly up to 1910. And this one looks a little more expedient as that's why um, dugouts were made to be expedient, especially in mining towns. Uh, this one has quite a steep roof on it. I've never seen one with this steep of a roof uh, with uh, a, quite a pitch to the gable on it. Uh, this one, as you can see, was the roof on it made with uh, looks like cedar logs or juniper logs that were cut and fashioned um, in a rudimentary uh, rafter uh, situation, which was then covered with uh, corrugated metal, one of my all-time favorite materials, by the way. Um, you can see on the back of this a chimney, uh, a tin chimney stove coming out of it, which uh, I'm not sure if the inside had any type of a brick um, place for the stove to go into the flue or if it just went directly into a, a sheet metal stove, which is probably more likely the case. The front of it, as you can see, is also of sawn log, probably railroad ties, as uh, the door frame and then the large uh, ridge pole over the roof. And then walls are of a variety of lumber and um, corrugated metal. So this one was housed a miner, and you can see that it was pretty small compared to the other two examples I've shown. For the final uh, example, we're going to the top end of the dugout realm. And this is a much more sophisticated one that dates most likely from the 19 teens or maybe even later. And this one is found in Carbon County. Anyone who's driven Nine Mile Canyon Road north out of Wellington uh, will recognize this one as it sits almost right on the road. It's not very far off of it. And you can tell this one was built by someone who planned on living here for quite a while. The outside, uh, from if you were standing right in front of it, would probably not even look like a dugout until you go to the side and see that it's partially 
built into a sloping hillside. Um, the walls are of poured uh, concrete. So that dates this at least to around uh, 1910, as poured concrete wasn't that common before then. You can see the even layers of it stacked up to uh, just above the height of the windows. And then the gable end is of soft fired uh, laid brick. You also notice uh, the vigas sticking out from the front. These are the log ends of the heavy round log purlins that support the roof. Again, this, this was a pretty substantial structure for a dugout meant to last a long time. And you can see that it has, even though it's been abandoned for decades, uh, it's still pretty intact. The uh, roof on this one, you can tell, has a pretty good sized gable and was stacked with dimension lumber. And there is evidence of several uh, willow trees or other type of uh, brush and mud that has collapsed inside that sat on top of the roof of this. Uh, there, there is no evidence of shingles, although I wouldn't be surprised to find that on this one. The interior, there's a partial shot of the interior on this showing just how fine the, um, the interior finish was on this. Uh, it was laid with the brick and the concrete and then plastered and whitewashed. Uh, you can see an inset uh, lumber two by four nailer there uh, used to nail things. Maybe this at one time had siding inside of it or some type of paneling. I'm not sure on that either. And then you can see the uh, nice partial uh, chimney there that had a hole in it for a stovepipe. Um, so this was set up as a nice house. And it's, I'm assuming it's still there. I haven't been by there in years. So I don't know why it wouldn't be there. I'm going to have to get by there at some point in the near future to, to check this place out again. But again, this was uh, the higher end, upper middle class demographic of dugout owners in the state. So that is our final example. There aren't a lot of uh, dugout examples left in the state. Um, mostly because, as I mentioned, they were um, expediently built, not of very stable materials, and were often removed or covered over with a house to utilize them as cellars. Others have just deteriorated over time or they're in areas that aren't settled anymore, and so we don't see them. If you happen to, to see a dugout in your wanderings around the state, we'd love to hear from you and see photos if you can get them, but don't tramp on public lands without permission or on private lands without permission. Um, so with that, that ends our discussion on dugouts. And we will talk more in the future about other types of historic Utah architecture. And hope to see you again. Thanks.